Um, okay, so uh, this I've titled this presentation "High Conflict in Quotes: Child Custody Litigation Involving Abuse and Alienation cl uh, Claims," and I will get to that in a second as to why I wrote it that way. Um, I'm a professor of law at GW. You already heard all of this. I was doing appellate work for the last 15 years in an organization I founded called Domestic Violence Legal Empowerment and Appeals Project while I continue to teach. Um, I'm no longer at DV Leap. I have now launched my own National Family Violence Law Center at GW. Okay. So why did I put quotes around the term high conflict? Hanita asked me to speak about high conflict cases. And I said to her, I don't like that term. And she said, okay, talk about that. So um, I, the, the reason I don't like the term is that um, high conflict, there may be such a thing, but I don't know of any definite definitions. And um, it tends to be used whenever someone is alleging abuse or domestic violence in a custody case. And in fact, my position and that of many people in, in the domestic violence field is, that it's not high conflict if you have an abuser in the family and another parent who's trying to stay safe and keep the children safe. That's not conflict. And the use of the word conflict um, is problematic because it, it conceals the reality of the situation. It makes it sound like we're talking about um, a battle between two people, uh, just a lot of conflict. And that's really not what abuse is. Um, if you think of a case as an abuse case, you would hopefully, hopefully recognize that you need expertise in the domestic violence or the child abuse, and you don't just need to talk about conflict. But when we treat it as conflict, it really removes the focus on the abuser, and it minimizes or ignores the realities of abuse, and it spreads some sense of accountability or the problems. It lays the problem at the door of both parties, which is really not correct when there's an abuse situation. So I put it in quotes, but it belongs in the conversation because courts and professionals very often use this term. And so I wanna invite the attendees to question the term and peel it back to see whether what we're talking about is an abuse case or not, uh, when, when someone calls something a high conflict case. Okay. Why this study? I'm just trying to make room on my screen here. Okay. Um, so I founded DB Leap, the appellate project in 2003, because I saw a, really, a real lack of resource for survivors and advocates who were losing cases at trial and needed to appeal. There was really nobody with any expertise in the field available to do appeals. It was kind of ad hoc. If someone could find someone, they were very lucky. So I found a DV Leap and of course, and it's a national entity and we got many, many requests for help. And within two years, most of what came in the door was custody cases involving abuse, which by the way, I had not wanted to be involved in because they're so painful and so difficult. I had sort of hoped that I would be doing other things, but this is what came in the door. This is what was absolutely pressing. And what we were seeing was that um, in particular where, and it was usually mothers, but not only mothers who were in the role of trying to be protective um, with usually fathers, but not only fathers being abusive or problematic for the children. And what we were finding in these cases was that when the protective parent alleged child abuse, it was particularly, there was typically a very re hostile response in the court. And when the alleged abuser claimed that the protective parent was an alienator committing parental alienation, and that the abuse claim was just a form of alienation. We found it very difficult. We were seeing that it was very difficult to dislodge the label and get out from under it to get the court to take abuse seriously. And you know, assuming that our the, the callers and people we consulted with and the clients that we accepted were telling us the truth, which I have no reason to question, the outcomes were really, really troubling and, and traumatic and disastrous. And in many cases, these protective parents were losing custody altogether and the children were in the hands and complete control of an abusive parent. So I had been um, lecturing on this, giving trainings, writing articles, um, and, and doing appellate cases where I, we were arguing these issues and we weren't making a lot of headway. And I decided we needed data because, and again, even the media wasn't taking the issue seriously. They didn't know it was a real issue and we didn't have the data to show them that, that it was. So we applied and thanks to everyone but me on this team who had the re required statistical expertise and two of whom, Leora and Chris, 
had National Institute of Justice connections and experience, um, we applied for a grant from the National Institute of Justice. We were incredibly lucky to get it. And I was also very lucky to have Sean Dixon on the team because he had uh, he had legal training, but he also had statistical and public health training, and he was a critical link in the team between me and everybody else and translating what we were finding into the right terms. So I want to pan back now a little bit into what um, we're talking about in this discussion. You would think there would be a definition of parental alienation by now because it is so ubiquitous in family courts, but in fact, there is no universal definition. Everyone defines it whenever they start talking about it, but everyone kind of knows what it means, which is that it means that when a child resists contact with a parent, it is because the parent they prefer has influenced them illegitimately, which is what they call alienating. Um, it is used in many ways, but that's the core essence of the concept. Uh, so when that label comes up, it means that one parent is bad, it, wrongly driving a wedge or alienating the children from the other parent. It is much more subjective than objective because there is no scientific or objectively um, objective means of diagnosing it. So it's, it's whatever a professional says it is. A professional comes in and says, this is alienation. That's what you've got. And there's no way to prove it wrong. You just have to argue that's not what it is or argue that the whole theory is not admissible, which is a whole other matter we can talk about if you like. Um, but there is, it has been confirmed that there is no scientifically based or objectively proven tool or diagnostic method for confirming that something is alienation as opposed to a child's resistance that's based on other reasons. For instance, children, especially after divorce, children very often are reluctant to have contact with the parent who moved out for many, many reasons. It may have to do with their age and their separation anxiety. There may be you know, a lack of good parental fit or personality differences that get exacerbated at separation. There may be new situations in the, the non-custodial parents' home that make the child uncomfortable. The, the non-custodial parent, whether or not they're actually abusive, may be harsh or neglectful. They may spend uh, full days with the children in the house, just putting the children on TV and then going about their business. Um, the, and then of course, in the cases that I'm concerned with in particular, often there has been, the children were previously exposed to some kind of abuse from the other parent, whether it was direct, directed at a child or it was directed at their, their, their safer parent. And whether or not it's directed at the child, that kind of exposure to domestic abuse and intimate partner violence can be very traumatic and terrifying for children. Um, and so once there's a separation and now they're being asked or expected to spend time alone with someone who was violent in the family, that can be much harder um, than it was to just sort of keep their head down and get through their day when everyone was living together. So there are, I would sum up these problems with the label of parental alienation. There's no objective way to sort through all these different reasons. Again, it's in the eye of the beholder or the assessor. And we are even seeing that even when um, evaluators or courts are aware that there's been some kind of abuse in the family and in our view, that's more than sufficient explanation for a child's avoidance. Even then you see proponents of the alienation concept will still slap the label alienation on. They might call it a hybrid case, meaning there's both abuse and alienation, but they'll focus solely on the alienation and ignore the abuse when it comes to remedies or interventions. So the bot my bottom line is that it's way too easy to label a case parental alienation and to blame a parent that a child is comfortable with instead of actually looking at the parent the child is not comfortable with and figuring out what's been the problem in their relationship, of which there are often many. And the case I'm here in Colorado for is a classic example. So here's just two examples from my DV Leap caseload. One of them was in Arkansas. And the evaluator had a great question for the child. What is your biggest worry? And the child's answer, and I think this was, these were boys and they were around nine or so. My biggest worry is my father killing me and saying my mother did it, which I think is a brilliant essence of intimate partner violence, <laughs> which is that the child senses that he's just a pawn to the abuser. He could be killed like that, but it would be for the purpose of hanging it on the mother, of, of, of destroying the mother, not because the child 
the father has animosity against the child just to hurt the mother, he's at risk, something that most professionals don't understand. So the evaluator then comes back and says that the boy's negativity toward his father is unnatural and abnormal and a manifestation of parental alienation syndrome. And that basically stuck in that case. Okay, second example is more recent from California. Um, in this case, the father was very abusive to the mother and generally in the family, very scary, but mostly violent, direct, direct his violence mostly at the mother, but very harsh with the children. He would grab them by the ear and drag them out of the room. He would humiliate one child who was on the, who was, had Asperger's and humiliate him in front of uh, guests. And they had witnessed multiple attacks on their mother. He ultimately raped her very brutally and she managed to record it and, and got him sentenced to six years in prison. But the question in the case was, what kind of visitation while he's in prison or after he gets out? And the child uh, says to the evaluator, I don't wanna be around my daddy when he's mad. And the evaluator says, this is a good evaluator. He says, frankly, this child is afraid of Mr. H. But the judge goes to a luncheon with an alienation expert. I think it was Joan Kelly and sits next to her at the table and poses his whatever he said to her about the case. And her answer is basically, well, whatever you do, you don't just put them in regular therapy because if it's alienation, that never works. So the judge comes back to court after this luncheon and says that the mother has created a revisionist history about the father's treatment of the children, that the boy's fear is just is merely collateral damage from the wife abuse and the product of her con conscious or unconscious statements to the children. Now, if you look at that, he's not denying that the boys are afraid, but since that wasn't the father's intent to make the boys afraid, apparently it doesn't matter. <laughs> and, um, and anything they're feeling isn't because of their own experience, it's all because of the mother and her agenda, which is an alienating agenda, according to an expert who has, knows nothing about the case. We won this case on appeal for the very reason that he used, he relied on evidence that never came into the case. We were not allowed, uh, our team was not allowed to cross-examine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so those are just a, a couple of case examples of how this theory plays out in, in court cases. And I'm sorry to say it continues to play out that way. Um, so what has happened over the last two decades, at least I would say, is that there's been a growing movement of what self-described protective parents parents in these cases who've been battling to keep their children safe and having way too much trouble doing it and um, have banded together doing certain protests, making you know policy interventions and advocating in a variety of ways. I certainly recommend many of these um, websites and pages. The court said is global. There is a, the court said hyphen USA, which my colleague Danielle Pollack helps administer. That's also on Facebook. Um, there are many other uh, good groups, including the Center for Judicial Excellence, Child Justice, which I know is represented on this call, um, et cetera, and, and of course my center. And what we know is that over 100 US children have been killed by a parent after a court refused to listen to a safe parent's pleas to, to only permit safe contact with supervision. Um, and that has been documented by the Center for Judicial Excellence. Um, and it's the, we, we suspect there are many, many more, but for lack of research funds and time, we haven't been able or they haven't been able to dig into all of the other 800 cases that they have, sorry, other 700 cases that they have documented where a parent has killed a child in the context of a separation. Um, once we, doc, we have the research to dive into those cases, we will have much more useful and valuable data and probably higher numbers. Um, there's a huge body of research and scholarship criticizing these problems, and there's a growing number of legislative proposals emerging at the state and federal level. We're very excited that there's a provision called Cadence Law in the Violence Against Women Act that so far is being retained um, in the Senate as the Senate's negotiating um, what it's going to do, and um, that provision incentivizes states to adopt more protective standards in custody and also gives uh, offers funding for um, very high quality training. Okay, so finally to the study that I was promising I would discuss. Um, we started in um, 2015, actually, very end of 2014. And, and, and the idea of the study was that we wanted a national picture and no other research up until that time had done a national picture. And I think the main reason is that um, 
there's nowhere to get, there's no national database. There's nowhere to get data on what's going on nationally. So what we decided to do was to look for electronically published court opinions, which 10 years earlier would not have existed. But by 2015, many, many, most published opinions are now also electronically published. And some other opinions that aren't generally published are also posted online. So we were able to get an incredible number, an overwhelming number of relevant cases through the electronic search. We limited it to private custody cases, meaning parent versus parent involving abuse or alienation claims. We got way too many cases um, and narrow and triaged it down to over 4,000. And we were, our coders were coding for many, many things, but for purposes of this uh, presentation, I'm gonna limit it to some very basic um, criteria. So um, here's the overview of what I'm gonna run through with you. Um, first, we looked at what we called the crediting of mother's abuse claims. So that what that means is, did the judge accept or believe decide to believe the abuse that the mother was alleging. And we focused on cases where mothers alleged abuse against fathers, but we also did some gender comparisons, which I'll get to, where the roles were reversed. So we looked at how often the courts accept the abuse claims, and then how, how often did courts remove custody from a mother alleging abuse and give it to the father who was accused of abuse. I will then discuss a, a couple very interesting gender comparisons. And lastly, I'll, I'll touch on what we found about what happens when there's either a guardian ad litem that is an advocate supposedly for the child's best interests or a, a court appointed evaluator. These are both what I would call neutral professionals and point, appointed by the court. What happens in those cases? Okay, so starting with how often courts accept abuse claims by mothers, we wanted to start to look at cases without alienation just to have a basically a, a base um, population. So if you looked at the cases where alienation was not alleged as a counterclaim, um, even then courts only believed um, mother's allegations of abuse less than half the time. It averaged out at 41% of the time. And as you can see, they believe child abuse far less than they believe partner violence, uh, extremely low rates, okay? So going in, no matter what happens on the other side, a mother who's reporting child abuse has a very steep uphill battle in custody court. Okay, now what happens when the accused abuser responds with an alienation claim against the reporting mother? All those rates go way, way down. So whereas it was 41% on average that the courts believe, now they only believe mothers 23% of the time on average. And again, you can see that even for partner violence, it goes down from 45% to 37%. Child physical abuse goes down from, well, uh, let's see, from 29% to 18%. And um, child sexual abuse plummets down from 15% to 2%. And this was one case out of roughly 50, and I can explain the roughly if you want me to later, but it's 2%, but it's a single case. So that means that if you're alleging child sexual abuse of your child and the father is smart enough, and most of them are, to respond with an alienation claim, your odds are insanely low that you're gonna get a court to believe the sexual abuse. And if they don't believe it, they're gonna be punitive towards you because they're gonna treat you as a lying fabricator, okay. The next slide just puts the comparison together that I just went through. So it shows visually what the difference between how often courts will believe or not believe, whether depending on whether there's an alienation cross claim in the case, the orange line is when there's not. So there's a higher rate of belief uh, than when there is alienation claim. And you can see how low uh, the rates of belief are in general. Okay. And another way of summarizing all of the, those findings is to say that alienation cross claims reduce the likelihood of any kind of abuse allegation being believed by a factor of two. Let me be clear though, this is only when it's the mother alleging abuse and the father alleging alienation. These findings are not comparable when those um, roles are reversed by gender. But when it's a mother alleging abuse, 
alienation reduces the likelihood of, of it being believed by a factor of two, but when she's alleging child abuse, it reduces the likelihood of it being believed by a factor of almost four. Very significant impact. Okay, I wanna say a word about child sexual abuse claims. Hmm. There we go. Okay, uh, only one claim out of 51 or 49 um, cases was believed when alienation was cross-claimed. And I just wanna specify, uh, hone in on this point for a minute, just to say that there is comparative data uh, where studies have been done to look at what the rates of false allegations seem to be in general. And um, Kathleen Fowler did a great overview of this data uh, a while ago. She looked at a bunch of studies and she concluded that um, between 50 and 73% of child sexual abuse allegations in the context of custody litigation are considered likely valid. And are considered means by people such as custody evaluators or child welfare personnel. And so this is a very conservative rate of likely valid because those professionals are pretty notorious in my field for being very cautious and skeptical of child abuse claims that arise in custody litigation. Everyone treats the custody litigation context as an indication that you shouldn't trust these kinds of allegations. And so that's a fairly high rate in that context of likely valid, but we have instead in courts 2%. So you can see from this comparison that it is extremely likely that many, many sexually abused children are being sent to their sexual abuser by courts which simply disbelieve it at a far greater rate than they should. Okay, moving on to mother's custody losses. So what's happening when the courts do and don't believe? Let me just be clear about how we defined custody losses. We defined it very narrowly because we didn't wanna get into arguments with audiences over well, your definition is so broad, of course you have a high rate of custody losses. So we just said, we're gonna define it the way a mother would define it, which is that she started out as the primary caregiver of the kid and she ended up, up without it. Um, so we're not talking about whether there's been a prior court order. We're just saying mom had the kids and dad ended up with them by court order. And because we define it this way, well, it, actually, no matter how we define it, <laughs> the data set that we have, which is, as I say, judicial opinions that are published, doesn't always say who started with the kids. So the numbers that, that we had to work with for these analyses were a little bit smaller, um, but they were sufficient to get statistically significant findings. So going back again to the, the simple domestic uh, abuse cases without alienation, what we found was that on average, um, mothers who allege any kind of abuse are um, at risk of losing custody to the alleged abuser about a quarter of the time. And if they're alleging child abuse, that's rates a little bit higher, um, which I'm happy to talk about the counterintuitive nature of that, which I can explain if anyone's interested at the end. So now what happens when there's a cross claim of, of uh, alienation? Again, remember that here we're looking at a bad outcome for mothers custody loss, and you see it shooting up um, when there's a cross claim of alienation. So um, where it was, it used to be that they had a one in four chance, sorry, of losing um, custody. Now they have roughly a one in two chance of losing custody if there's an alienation cross claim, and particularly if they're alleging child abuse of any kind. Um, so again, alienation is doing a lot of labor for a allegedly abusive fathers. And again, this is the visual comparison, but this time the higher, the, the longer bar is the, is the bad outcomes, it's the custody losses, and the shorter bar is the uh, cases without alienation claims where the custody losses are lower. Again, to translate this in terms of odds, what this means is that when fathers cross claim alienation, they have almost three times the odds of taking custody from mothers who are alleging any kind of abuse than when they do not cross claim alienation. So it's an extremely effective weapon for fathers accused of abuse. Now, what's really striking about this in addition, and this, this 
um, when I first presented this data many years ago to uh, a handful of custody evaluators in a conference room, one of them who was well known in my in the Maryland and DC area kept saying, wait a minute, when abuse is confirmed, wait, you're saying when the court found domestic violence, she couldn't believe what I was saying, that when courts even find some kind of domestic violence, they're still giving custody to the, to the, to the batterers. Um, I'm happy to report they did not do that if they found child sexual abuse, but they did do that if they found some form of child physical abuse. And I will say that these cases are a little spongy uh, because when we looked at the facts, they were, they were borderline facts. They weren't extreme child physical abuse. But even finding intimate partner violence, they're, they're handing over custody. And although I haven't done the um, analysis yet, I suspect this is because of alienation, because when they find the parents an alienator, that tends to trump anything else. So moving on to the gender findings, which I find very interesting. Here's a summary of them first, and then I'll go into them. First of all, we're able to, to conclude that alienation's power as a claim is overall gendered. It works very well for men, but not so well for mothers, who are, and even when each one is accused of abuse. Um, what's interesting is that in terms of our data, we did not see as clear of a gender difference in the cases where there was not an abuse issue. So in the cases where it was just about alienation, at least according to the judge's opinion, um, we saw a much closer rate of impact or custody loss for each gender, although it was still not identical. So again, going back to the first point. So what we found was that across all alienation cases, and that includes some without abuse claims and many with, um, that when fathers accused mothers of alienation, they were able to take custody away 44% of the time. But when mothers accused fathers of alienation, they took custody away in only 28% of cases. Now, again, I'm, I'm starting with a small, fairly small number of cases because of our ability to identify who started with custody was limited. Um, but these are statistically significant findings. Um, and what they showed was that mothers have twice the odds of losing custody compared to fathers when they're accused of alienation across the board, including abuse and non-abuse. I will also say that when we talk about being accused of alienation, this is driven by findings of alienation. Um, but I, I like to talk about it in terms of the accusation because I'm looking at this from the standpoint of a litigant and a lawyer going into court and not knowing what's gonna happen um, and thinking about their odds. So we did do some regression analysis, preliminary ones. And what we found was that when mothers allege child abuse, their custody losses are predicted to increase from 32% to 52% if an alienation claim is raised. But when fathers accuse mothers of any type of abuse, um, and, and the mothers say that the father's an alienator, we found no predicted effect on the rates of father's custody losses. We're, we are hoping very soon to, to publish, uh, to put together and publish um, a much more robust set of regression analyses on these issues to show how alienation and gender uh, interact in these cases. But here are some interesting just um, frequencies that we found uh, that arguably uh, could be framed as gender parity. So first of all, when alienation is alleged by either parent against the other and the courts believe the allegation, fathers and mothers lose custody at identical rates. That was quite striking, 71%, very high rate. And in the cases without abuse claims, as far as we could tell, that while mothers did worse than fathers in terms of losing custody uh, when accused of alienation, it was uh, not a statistically significant difference. So it's possible that this is a relative parity. We don't quite know because we don't have enough numbers. There's some more analyses we're gonna do that will expand our numbers and, and get more robust findings on some of these. Okay, so the way I summarize these findings on gender and alienation is that our study actually offers something for everyone. And, and what I'm referring to is that there's a big divide in the field, in the family court world between people who tout parental alienation and use that lens for cases and people who specialize in abuse and are really fighting against that label all the time and saying it's being misused. We have findings that support some of the arguments on both sides. So first, first of all, um, 
obviously the gender differences in, in, in how abuse and alienation cross claims operate are very consistent with the, a very widespread critique from protective parents and professionals in the abuse field, which is that alienation in these cases is seems to be gendered and is, is very effectively denying mothers and children's claims of paternal abuse. But we also, if you look at the relative gender parity in the non-abuse cases, as well as in the cases where there was abuse claim but alienation was validated, these populations support the argument that alienation is not entirely or solely a gender biased claim certainly support the uh, the claim that, that alienation proponents make, which is that, hey, this isn't about gender. Women are being alienated all the time and they're, they're accusing men of alienation and this is really not about gender. And um, you know, our answer is more subtle. It, it is about gender in some contexts when it comes to abuse claims, may not be about gender in other contexts. Of course, it was invented as a very gendered idea, um, but Nowadays, people don't like to go back to that source. Um, I will say that uh, when I was at DV Leap, I did get um, requests from a handful of fathers who were trying to protect their kids from an emotionally abusive mother and were being accused of alienation. And we saw identical dynamics in those cases. The fathers could do nothing right. The mothers could do nothing wrong. It was quite remarkable to see the same dyna dynamic play out in court. Okay. Um, and lastly, I wanna just discuss what we found when it comes to neutral court appointees, guardians ad litem for children and evaluators. So first, what we found was that- uh, I'm sorry, was that a question? No, you can go ahead. I think someone was just accidentally unmuted. Okay. Um, so when there's a guardian ad litem in the case, um, mothers alleging abuse are what we found that they are three to five times more likely to lose custody with the presence of a GAL, especially when they were, so the higher part of that range was when they were alleging either physical child abuse or mixed physical and sexual child abuse. We broke down how we coded abuse allegations into five categories. I haven't broken those down in most of this presentation, but when it came to this analysis, those two types of allegations were the ones that were most um, problematic for mothers when there was a GAL in the case. And we were able to compare when a, a protective father was alleging abuse by a mother and found that GALs had no statistically significant impact on fathers' likelihoods of losing custody when they were alleging uh, abuse. Similar, with, similar findings with neutral custody evaluators. When an evaluator was present, mothers alleging abuse were from range from 2.5 to 6.5 times more likely to lose custody than when there was no evaluator in the case. These higher frequencies occurred when mothers alleged physical child abuse or mixed physical and sexual child abuse. By the way, we have no idea why those two categories, but not child sexual abuse alone or mixed adult violence and child abuse, those two categories did not show up this negative impact of evaluators on mothers' cases. We don't know why that distinction, and it may just it may not be meaningful, but that's what our data showed. Um, and again, we found that evaluators had no statistically significant impact on protective fathers' likelihood of losing custody. So I need to emphasize some of the limitations of the study. Um, first of all, and this is a, a bone of contention in the, in the larger field, the study does not demonstrate that courts were wrong about what they found or about what they did. Oh, this study just reflects back what courts are finding and doing. We were in no position to judge the facts and judge whether they were right or wrong. Secondly, Jones, before, before you go forward, there was a question and I don't uh, want to go too long without raising it. Yeah. It's in the chat. Uh, Leanne asks, isn't it then post-separation abuse if alienation is occurring, it should be listed as specific behaviors rather than parental alienation question, then the court can assess these actual behaviors rather than it is trumped up term, than this trumped up term. That's absolutely what those of us who are contending with this issue in court are arguing. Stop using a label and all of the pathologizing that attaches to the label. Look at the behaviors and see if you can verify that there are actually concrete, specific behaviors with an intent to undermine the other parent's relationship. 
before you slap the label on. Um, and yes, many of us would argue that alienation claims themselves and custody litigation itself by abusive parents is a form of continued abuse, post-separation abuse. Um, that is not something that the courts have the slightest understanding of or acceptance of, but I think that that frame needs to be expanded and distributed, you know, gotten out very widely. And I'm really grateful to those, many of whom are not professionals, but are survivors who have said to me, that's abuse. Alienation is, is coercive control. And I'm like, hmm, yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> so, um, it, but that's kind of a new argument uh, that needs to be made more, I think. And hopefully supported by um, researchers who can write scholarly articles defining it as such and explaining why it meets the definition. So the second um, limitation of this study is that because we were looking at electronically reported decisions, we were stuck with almost, almost entirely cases that had been appealed because appellate decisions get published, trial court decisions don't usually get published, and, and we knew that going in. What was surprising and, and, and positive to us is that when we did collect the electronic decisions, we had a fairly significant minority of cases that were not appeals, that were trial court decisions that had gone, that had been published online. And um, that allowed us to do some comparisons. So if you just look at the asterisk at the bottom, we did try to compare, uh, uh, separate out the trial court opinions from the cases that had been appealed. Let me be very clear though, even in the appeal cases, we were analyzing what the trial court did because we were interested in how trial courts respond to these allegations. And we knew that what appellate courts do is very different. It's a legal analysis that could be technical and not a reflection of a view of alienation or abuse. We wanted courts views of those, those claims. So anyway, so um, when we compared the cases that had not gone to appeal to the cases that did go to appeal, we did find a difference, a significant difference in the rates of custody losses, which I think is good news, <laughs> which is that there were, lower rates of custody losses among the trial court opinions uh, that had not been appealed. And that doesn't surprise anyone because of course it's when you lose custody that you're most likely to appeal. So the custody losses are overrepresented in the appellate um, population of our data. But, um, but with regard to other issues like believe, believing allegations and gender differences, we did not see in our, our initial pass through in this comparison, we did not see significant differences between the cases that had been appealed and the cases that hadn't been. Um, and then lastly, um, our, the way I'm, I've been talking about the, the findings has been characterizing cases as having abuse allegations or not, having alienation allegations or not. We are limited by our data source, which is the judge's opinion that's published. And as many of you may know, judicial opinions are not always comprehensive about what's happening in the case or what has happened. So it is very possible, it's probably likely that there were abuse or alienation claims that were raised in the litigation, but weren't described in the opinion itself. I actually think that that does not hurt our findings. I think it strengthens them. And I'm happy to explain that if anyone wants me to in the Q&A. Um, but that is a reality of how we're analyzing the cases. We can't be sure that these allegations weren't buried somewhere earlier in the case. So that is the sum up of the study. And I welcome follow-up questions and emails. And if you want to join my National Family Violence Law Center's e-newsletter list, please email me and we'll add you on. Um, the study itself was published. It's available on Social Science Research Network, which is online and open to the public in um, two forms. One is the full the report, the final report we submitted to the NIJ, which has more information than I just described. Um, and the other is in a peer reviewed journal, the Journal of Social Welfare and Family Law, which um, has less information than I just described uh, because of uh, word limits. But um, I can also share either of those with you. <laughs>